Uh, my name's Alison uh, and I work for an organisation called Sport England. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of us, we're an arm's length body of government which was established by Royal Charter back in 1996. We're responsible for growing and developing grassroots sport and helping more people get active across England. We use our expertise, our insight, our campaigns and our targeted funding from the government and the National Lottery to do just that. Uh, you can see our vision on the screen on the slide and this uh, is our vision for the next 10 years. But we recognise that Sport England can't achieve this vision alone. Our latest strategy uh, called Uniting the Movement, it requires a shift in the way we as both Sport England and the sector that we're in is working. And this shift is going to come from both the design of what we do together and how we implement the work we do together. Uh, Open Active as a community-based initiative is a great example of what we're aspiring to do more of. So you can see on this slide, there's overwhelming evidence for the life benefits of being active from childhood right through to old age. Every year, these benefits deliver billions of pounds of value to our healthcare system, society and the economy. Yet we're still only using a small part of its potential. This is demonstrated by our Active Lives survey, which is a nationally representative survey that gathers data about how active people are. It is gathered on both adults and children's behaviours and motivations. And the latest figures from back in November, um, these figures show that 17.6 million, or approximately 38% of the English population of adults are not getting the benefits of being regularly active. While activity levels did stabilise following the height of the pandemic, this still masks a concerning underlying picture. Young adults continue to see activity levels that fall at worrying rates, while physical spaces such as gyms and leisure centres are seeing a very slow recovery in the numbers of people returning. There also remain very wide inequalities with the least affluent being the most impacted. So with not enough people getting the benefits of being active, this presents an opportunity for our sector to change and adapt to enable more adults and children to be active in the ways they wish to choose to be. And I guess this is where our open data mission really started. It started with one key problem, and that is that time and again, we hear that people can't find physical activity in their local area. Finding the right activity is just too painful and the user experience puts people off. So in April 2019, we commissioned a survey which actually revealed that it's twice as easy to order a takeaway than it is to book physical activity online. With the increasing amount of time we've all spent since COVID uh, online, this means the expectations of finding information about physical activity online are ever increasing and just the norm. The cost of living crisis will also have an impact in the coming months for physical activity with people possibly reducing costs on membership in lieu of other costs rising. Therefore, a focus on improving the user experience is even more important than ever. And we've been aware of this problem probably since 2012, uh, but we didn't start with open data back then. Uh, we ran a pilot with UK Active to develop a single place or a website for consumers to find and book sport. At the time, this was seen as a critical enabler of interest that was likely to be generated by the 2012 Olympics. The website at the time was called SPOGO, which was short for Sport on the Go. Uh, and I guess here's a lovely screenshot of what websites looked like back in 2013. Uh, pretty simple. Um, but the pilot achieved, it did achieve some big things, uh, I guess. But the reason we stopped it in 2015 was due to three main things. The first being that the cost and the marketing cost in particular to, to basically ensure that all of England knew that this website existed was prohibitive and just not sustainable over the longer term. It also became really clear from our consumer research that a one size fits all approach of a single website was just too limiting. Something that works for someone who's already active is very unlikely to provide the experience that someone needs who's taking their first steps into activity. So we need different solutions for different people. And I guess the third learning was basically that the data needed to create SPOGO uh, was not available in a high enough quality to ensure a strong experience for the consumer either. We know that this data is critical, so we also then needed to look at other models to solve that problem of finding activities in your local area. And this led us to speaking to the Open Data Institute, um, or the ODI, uh, as we like to call them, uh, and 
we explored together the creation of an open data ecosystem. We were seeing open data being used in other sectors like travel and banking, so it made a lot of sense at the time to explore it for our sector. At the time, the ODI were also supporting a number of startups and early advocates for open data who were passionate about solving that same problem as us. This included organisations like IMIN, London Sport and Playfinder. And then as a result of all those conversations, Sport England made the decision to invest and in November 2016, our commitment to supporting Open Active was announced at the ODI's conference. So I'll now hand over to Howard, uh, who will explain what Open Active is. Hello everyone, I'm Howard, a senior data technologist at the Open Data Institute and the technical lead for this phase of Open Active. So, so what is Open Active? It's a set of data standards and tools. We've created data standards that enable publishers to describe opportunities for sport and physical activity. That could be sessions and events, both physical and virtual, to describe facilities like squash courts or swim pools and routes. And they can include demographic suitability and accessibility requirements. And the standards enable to go to um, to make bookings through third party sites. And we also have a set of tools to support developers, as well as those tools that are data literacy guides, such as e-learning guidance and advocacy support, and templates that make it easy for organizations to make Open Active a reality for them. Open Active is, is the community. It's The initiative is made up of like-minded individuals and organizations from activity providers like GLL and national governing bodies like EMD, to system providers and intermediaries like IMIN, as well as data users like MCR Active and This Girl Can. And there's a dedicated team of people embedded in the ODI. It's a diverse community. It started from those sports specific bodies, the national governing bodies, but has grown, grown to include new businesses and startups. And the initiative also has a lot of evidence of the value of open data in this sector and, and learning. So we've collated lots of evidence along the way. Case studies from various organizations who have published and used the data, as well as evidence about what works and what doesn't. It's probably important to talk as much about uh, what Open Active isn't. It's not a, a single database of activities or one single app. Instead, it's there are lots of API feeds that organizations use to publish their opportunity data through. And this makes it possible for others to integrate the data in lots of different ways. It's not just an activity finder. It's grown from the days of Spogo through um, the data is now used by a range of different activity finders to meet different, to suit different audiences. And it's not a single solution. There's no mag magic bullet or a single answer that will make it easy for everyone to find the right activity for them. People are just too unique in their needs and lifestyles. However, we believe that strong data foundations are necessary to enable the innovation required for people to create amazing front end experiences and to support the sector to improve its data and digital capabilities. So, these are some examples of the, the types of data in open active data feeds. Activities and events, the things that people can do, and facilities, the places they can, they can go to do them. And these are the two leading types by data volume and coverage. When the pandemic hit, open active rapidly diversified to cater for virtual activities. And it's also laid solid foundations in relating to, to routing via a route specification. And you see some example data properties there. The, it includes all the things that consumers need to know in order for the data to be useful, like the date and time and location of an event or facility and their availability. It's important to note this isn't personal data. So the infrastructure behind Open Active, there are some key areas, The uh, what we call the modeling, the, opportunity data, uh, opportunities for sport and physical activity. So the opportunity model represents the schema and the data standard for openly published activities and facilities. And we're at version two of that specification. And by implementing an opportunity API or publishing data through a system that has implemented it, the data publisher can make their data 
publicly available for consumption by a range of data users for activity finders and consumers. And this is data discovery. And beyond that discovery, the open booking specification um, establishes the conditions between brokers, sellers, and buyers when it comes to booking an activity or facility. And this is a pick who you work with environment. And by that we mean sellers must agree to the terms of a broker and the brokers will process bookings by buyers on behalf of those sellers according to the terms. And this can be likened to environments like booking.com or Skyscanner or, and Expedia in travel. Open Active has also created and maintains a range of infrastructure tools and data assets. And these include the activity list, a standardized list of over 600 sport, 650 sports and activity types. And think of this as key reference data for the sector. And there are tools like the Visualizer and Test Suite, which help developers and implementers test the quality of their, of their open data feeds and interrogate the data. So this is an example of uh, the current stage page showing some of the uh, API feeds that are, that are up and running there. And it's grown from eight early advocates to over 100 organizations now as part of the community, with over 200 active API feeds sharing a wealth of sport and physical activity data. And these include na large national leisure operators like GLL, Everyone Active and Fusion, national governing bodies like England Athletics and Badminton England, and booking system providers like Playways and BookTech, who enable small and grassroots to pro providers to open up their data for under free, freemium, and software as a service models. Here's some examples of the uh, leading brands and campaigns and national bodies, and charities and startups that we that use the data. So today we stand at 69 data publishers and you know, ranging between 400 and um, half a million, 400,000 half a million opportunities open data each month. Um, covering 1,200 locations. And that gives a sense of the scale of how we've moved on from those eight early advocates to this to this community of over 100 organizations, data publishers, and data users. And it's this scale, nearly half a million um, opportunities available each month, combined with the, the strong technical standards and the tools that uh, represent Open Active's greatest assets. I'll hand back to Alison now to talk a little bit more about what we've learned along the way. Thanks, Howard. So I think although Open Active has existed for six years, we're still quite early on in our journey. Uh, we're now only beginning to reach the end of the development of those core assets and infrastructure, which are enabling us to consider what market maturity might look like. We're in a really exciting position, but it's also a time when the decisions we'll be taking now will be laying the foundations for the next 10 years. And we certainly aren't taking those decisions lightly. Uh, starting from the perspective of the consumer has always been challenging for us as most open data ecosystems have started from the perspective of the sector uh, and have been able to regulate a lot of the changes that they're see seeking to make to allow that open data to be published. I guess the perfect example there is open banking. Um, but we wanted to you know, really start to create this ecosystem to be sustainable from the start, which was why we chose not to use kind of that stick of regulation and to focus on being able to prove and deliver value to people who are opening up their data. But demonstrating value back has and remains the most critical and hardest step. Um, when you get it right, it can certainly lead to others uh, to start their journey and encourage high quality data to be published and used. But I think what we've learned is that value, as, as you know, also it means different things to different people. And I think we'd be honest in saying that not everyone in our community has seen that value yet, and it remains our biggest mission, mission to achieving sustainability along the way. In terms of some examples of where we have seen some value, um, there's a couple on the slide here, I guess I'll just focus on one being kind of uh, everyone active, who if you don't know them, they're a leisure center operator with a number of different gyms and leisure center sites across the country. Um, as a, use, uh, as a result of using open data, they've been able to evidence an increase in their customer base by around 11,500 people, thanks to their open data primarily being used by a consumer facing solution called MoveGB. 95% um, of those customers as well had never been members before. 
So the potential to replicate that type of return across the country for lots of different operators is really exciting and what keeps us keeps us going. But in terms of what we've learned as well over the last six years, we've definitely learned loads. I've just pulled out kind of three key learnings here. The first being that data standards on their own definitely can't guarantee quality. Um, I think while the data being published obviously meets the standards, it isn't always the right level of quality for people or consumers, you know, people to use to actually make those choices about which physical activities are right for them. For example, uh, the pictures that go up with the data is really important to people. Um, so Im imagine you get a screen and all the pictures are the same, have the same bit of equipment that doesn't relate to the session that you're trying to book. It's not very helpful uh, in terms of making a choice as to whether that physical activity is right for you. Um, we've also learned that, you know, obviously, ideally, data users are able to feed back in on any issues that they're seeing with the standards and that activity providers see the value in fixing those problems. Um, but those feedbacks as loops are still something that we're developing and providing support to ensure we get them right. Uh, and the way that we've written the standards uh, has also meant that quite a high level of technical know-how is currently required for people to publish their data and for others to use it. And this is stopping many organizations prioritizing this. So we need to do more to improve the usability for people with lower technical skills as well. The second learning is very much about our own sector. So I guess the sport and physical act activity sector is very fragmented. It contains a lot of different organizations with different priorities, different audiences, different sizes and levels of technical skill. So I guess it, as an example, even if we got all the leisure operators around the table and there are hundreds, you'd still only be representing around 30% of the whole market. So that's quite challenging for us. Uh, and the third learning is, uh, is about the use cases, I guess, that prove the value that we've talked about earlier. The problem I guess we had here was we actually picked one of the hardest problems from a user's perspective to solve. It's not, not to say we shouldn't have gone there, but I think our starting vision was also built on probably too many assumptions from day one. And we asked of probably too many changes in a very complicated system up front. Um, so although we have a good amount of data being published, we still haven't really generated enough value back, as I said earlier, to, to those that have published their data. And this is causing open data to be seen as maybe a nice to have rather than a must do. And that's the thing we want to shift next. We've also learned that uh, open data is just one piece of the puzzle in terms of a data or a digital transformation journey. Uh, there's lots of systemic barriers that we continue to come up against in terms of implementing this type of initiative. Uh, I've listed three there, um, but I'll just talk to one in the um, uh, conscious of time. So I guess one is definitely around like the investment in digital skills. Um, during the pandemic in particular, we saw many people, many organizations in our sector have definitely acknowledged the value of digital transformation, whether that was through them launching an activity finder to stay relevant, you know, to switching to online classes or creating a hybrid approach that allowed them to meet the changing needs and rules that we were living under. Um, but at every level, I guess we're finding that there's a profound underinvestment and lack of prioritization of data and digital skills across our sector. Um, therefore, something like Open Active will always struggle to gain momentum until we also see a change in the skill levels alongside the effort we're putting into creating this open data system. So I'll now hand back to Howard and he's going to share where we're going to go next with Open Active. Thanks, Alison. So the, this phase we're entering now is, is about making the initiative sustainable in the long run. The context in which Open Active operates you know, has, has clearly shifted, not least due to the pandemic and the, the cost of living crisis. But Sport England has also developed a new 10-year strategy that focused more of its energy and resources on addressing inequalities that exist uh, as the most important issue that public money goes towards. So they see open data infrastructure as a critical enabler of addressing those inequalities, but need to support more individuals and organisations to be able to use the tools and data that are opening up to support use cases for the people that need it most. So a key area to focus on is around enabling the sector to become more confident in sharing and using data, to build on the data infrastructure to improve user experience, especially for those underrepresented groups. So our focus will be on tackling the challenges that are preventing open active from creating the conditions to shift the sport 
and physical activity sector from data fragmentation to data standardization with a view to getting people more physically active and that that means four areas to focus on really stronger governance mechanisms so we're looking at the potential for a single legal entity for open active like a data institution so it has a permanent home and maintaining the data infrastructure to ensure it's robust and efficient and easier to access and use so this includes the the modeling uh, opportunity modeling specification the booking api key reference data like the activity list and the developer tools and learning materials and as open active refines its approach to achieve greater social impact the initiative needs to develop an easy to use process that enables people to identify catalyze and support the emergence of new use case communities that apply open active infrastructure to get people moving so for example we're seeing a lot of interest in the areas of social prescribing and school activities and supporting disabled people to be more activity active and a big part of uh, helping open active to be sustainable is increasing the ways in which we can demonstrate value to all these different groups across the sector to demonstrate value in an agile and an easy way so a focus in this phase will be exploring more use cases at those smaller scales creating a simple framework for people to pick up and use the data to meet different challenges across the sector and to um, finally there number four to keep on communicating and engaging to build continue building the community understanding the challenges promoting the standards and providing a platform to share ideas and build on the data standards built over previous phases with a view to improving people's health and well-being reducing health inequalities and embedding the use of data and digital support wider policy initiatives related to people skills and business so uh, and I think we're, we're about there. So thank you for listening. That's uh, the story of Open Active. Um, we're happy to take questions now, but there are lots of ways to get involved. Um, so get in touch by email. You can come along to a drop-in session. We have those every fortnight if you want to learn more or, or post questions and bring ideas. Join the Slack channel and join the mailing list. I'll share links for those. Uh, and to join the W3C community group. And W3C stands for World Wide Web Consortium, and that's the standards body that manages a wide range of web and data standards. And the WC3 community groups are an ideal platform for collaboration, an open forum without fees where developers, designers, and stakeholders can hold discussions, publish ideas, develop standards and specifications. You don't need to be technical. It's a forum where you can be heard and share your ideas and contribute to the standards. So any questions? I can. I think he has some alerts as things go in. We have had a question about data quality. So thank you, Matt. Um, can you tell us about your approach to managing data quality with, with such a big open data set? I think um, in my experience and understanding, in the early days of Open Active, the the focus was on making it as easy as possible for data publishers to get data out there. And that was essential to create the, the kind of uh, momentum in the in the initiative. But perhaps that has created some problems in that by being flexible in the ways that publishers could share data, it makes it then harder at the other end for people to pick up and use that data. So I think there are some data quality issues that we need to explore. And so part of the the um, focus for our work in this phase as we kind of look at data quality and usage across different use cases is to explore data quality and, and you know, explore how we can report on data quality on an ongoing basis to identify those areas of specification that might be contributing to, to making it difficult for people to pick up and use the data. So that is certainly something we want to explore in, in the next, in the coming months. Um, so if you have ideas for how we might manage that approach, um, either please do join in or share um, share your thoughts. So my plan is to you know do some a bit of a deep dive into the data, data quality analysis. We've got so many different data quality dimensions, but it's important to, to look at it from the perspective of data users, the data publishers, 
those systems providers, everyone across the community really is going to have a different view on what data quality means. And um, so we need to take a quite a broad look. But my plan is to roll that into some kind of reporting framework that we can share that will go out to the community for comment, obviously, in consultation. Um, and we aim to improve the the tools that let data publishers um, inspect the quality, their own quality, you know, and, and they can act on it there. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I did ask, I'm from the Government Data Quality Hub. Um, so we do support all kinds of public sector organisations and so if Sports England are interested in um, approaching us for support, and I'm sure we'd be happy to chat. Um, and our advice is free to public sector. So um, <laughs> everyone likes the word free. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. I'm sure we'll be in touch. And question from Nick. Does anyone here on the call think that would be interested in using the data? Does anyone here have anywhere that could promote this data for general use? Nick is one of the, the key figures uh, from IMIN. Um, described as an intermediary earlier in the in the discussion, um, so key figure in the open active initiative. So, and I should have um, I should have maybe asked those questions myself. So, I, I don't have a list of all the uh, participants, so I'm not sure what kind of organisations are represented. But if anyone's interested in um, using sport and physical activity data in new and interesting ways, do get in touch. And if you're interested in publishing um, primary data on sport and physical, uh, physical activities, again, please get in touch and we can, through any of these channels, and we can um, walk you through the, the process. Yeah, sorry, it's, uh, it's Nikki. I just had a sudden, a sudden thought that someone, Matt, mentioned that data. Um, uh, uh, stuff data quality stuff central i just realized that data.gov or there might be there might be some kind of government hub some kind of data catalog that we might be able to list these data sources in so that they get more exposure and maybe that's a question for matt if you happen to know if people are getting exposure for their open data through government stuff that isn't sport specific to make sure it gets out there into the the wider world i'm not sure if there's, <laughs> there's question across rather than <laughs> Well, that, that's yeah. a really interesting question. Go on, Matt, if you have thought. No, no, I, I have an answer. I was say it's a very interesting question. I'd love to know the answer, but unfortunately, I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, and I think data.gov.uk has, you know, it, there's a lot, a lot on there, but it's not the simplest search tool or, um, you know, in, in terms of metadata and data discovery, there's a lot of lessons you can learn from, from that kind of platform. There are alternatives. Um, but yeah, interested in anyone's views in, in how how to promote data discovery. Um, my view, I think, was to make more of the activity list and have that as a kind of hub that um, people can make that discoverable and then they can launch off from the activities of interest. So. Yeah. Apologies to plug Data Connect while well, I've got my Data Connect background on, but there are there's some interesting sessions on um, that have been on this week. I think about kind of discovery um, and one or two sessions about metadata as well as part and that will lead into discovery as well. So yeah, definitely, if you have a chance to uh, connect with some of those colleagues as well, they might have some really interesting thoughts that you could uh, work together on. That's great. Uh, I wasn't at the other sessions, so appreciate that's probably that's the answer fine. is go to the other sessions where we're talking <laughs> yeah. about in detail from people that are doing it. Yeah, it sounds like sorry. a great idea. It's <laughs> cop out, but yeah, like I said, um, have a look through the calendar and if there's something you've missed and you, you want to try and get in touch with those people, then um, just get in touch with Data Connect team and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Brilliant. Well, I think we'll probably leave it there. So just to say thank you very much to um, Data Connect for having us and thanks to Alison and uh, please do get in touch if you'd like to learn more. <laughs>